So Vilma was incarcerated for five or six years and she owed over $50,000 in restitution. And an important note about that is that the restitution was owed to her husband's health insurance company. It wasn't directly restitution for him. He received the hospitalization and, and the health services, but she knew he was he had recovered and the debt was to these insurance companies. So it's another example of where private companies are embedded in this punishment system and in many ways are profiting off of it. Bail is a cash incentive where a person is required to come up with a monetary amount once they have been charged with a crime. And so the judge inputs a bond for the person to come out of jail um, so they would be able to come back to court um, with that monetary incentive. And remember, this is before they're even um, convicted of being guilty or innocent from this crime. And we have to remember that it is a fundamental right of a person to be presumed innocent um, before uh, they're found guilty in a court of law. And so when these are implemented um, on um, citizens, they're held in jail while they are trying to fight their case. And so the Bell Project came about um, by the founder Robin Steinberg in 1997, where she was working as a public defender, and she noticed that she had a lot of clients that were being held on bail um, that could not afford cash bail to get out of jail and to fight their case. And so she created um, the Bronx Freedom Fund to help post bond for these individuals that they can fight their case outside of jail instead of being remanded in jail until they can go back to court for their next court appearance. Bond is set by the judge's discretion. So depending on the type of the offense, you would assume that it would be a higher amount of bond or bail that, that is set for the person to come out of jail. Within Harris County, we have noticed that bond is actually set higher than most of uh, the other cities around the nation. Um, and so we can see from misdemeanor offenses that could be a couple thousand dollars that would be the same for something that would be a, a felony offense. And so in the cases of, that go to court, people can be on the same kind of uh, charge, uh, but they may get two different types amount of bond um, because the judge is trying to make sure that this person is going to return with implementing this um, cash incentive so they can come back to court. Um, what hurts um, citizens is, and typically it's usually Latino and African Americans, is those are the ones that are being pressed with the highest amount of bond um, on their charges. Um, remember, these are the most vulnerable, which um, they are already typically fighting poverty. Um, they are already strapped for cash, um, and they have a lot of other issues that are keeping them in poverty, and now they're dealing with coming up with this money to come out of jail to fight for their case. And this is not even including anything that they would have to pay with an attorney. Um, maybe their bills are stacking up while they're incarcerated, or dealing with any type of um, mental health or physical health issues that they're dealing while they're incarcerated that postpones them from getting the help that they need while they're waiting to post bond to come out of jail to fight their case. This is Susie from the Bell Project. I was calling him in regards to Valentino Vasquez. And so we're looking at his case to possibly post his bond and we wanted to verify with him the bond conditions and bond amount and any supporting information for him.
Yeah, so my name's Eli Mensing, and I work as a client advocate at the Harris County Public Defender's Office. With bail bonds and free trial, free trial release and bonds, it was initially developed as a way to let people be released while their trial is going on, because again, they're legally innocent. And at first, in the early parts of American history, the only goal was to make sure the clients came to all of their court dates, that they didn't fail to appear. But it's just been slowly morphed over time with you know, the war on drugs and the war on crime to incorporate this idea of public safety more and more. So now judges, especially in Harris County, where they're elected, uh, typically think of both like public safety and failure to appear when a client uh, comes to them for a bond and like when they're trying to set the cash bond amount for their release. But again, there's a contradiction in like, the cash bail system where if you have money, you can be released and, and that's it, period. So it's directly tying this idea of public safety to money because typically judges will in set a higher amount of cash bail for people who they deem are dangerous by their own, uh, just by their own intuition. And so what happens is people who are like completely the same, same charges, same set of facts that went into their arrest. If one of them has money and one doesn't, one's getting released and one doesn't. It like just, just, and so it's a contradiction there saying that money makes people safe, which is not true at all. It's discriminatory and it's prejudiced against low income people. And again, particularly people of color who do not have the same kind of wealth as uh, white people to be able to accumulate uh, in this country. Anyone on bond is still legally innocent in the eyes of law. If they're innocent before they're proven guilty, and they still, they're still going through their trial and have not been convicted yet. So I think a big challenge is just the time commitment, honestly, that goes into, again, all of these pretrial bond requirements. Uh, if they have to come down downtown for in-person check-ins, so again, if they don't have transportation, they can't, it's, or not have access to Houston's very limited public transportation, it's very hard to get down here. Two, with in-person check-ins, parking is not free downtown. It ranges from five, 10, 15, 20 dollars. And some of my clients, that's not money that they have, or that's money that's better spent feeding themselves, feeding their kids, maybe paying their court fines so they avoid jail. Um, also, it's just a huge time commitment. You know, oftentimes I'm here downtown and the line for the pretrial service office wraps all the way around the building. That lasts hours. And those are hours that my clients aren't spending at their job or trying to find a job, so destabilizing their employment, which destabilizes their ability to pay rent, to pay their medical bills, pay their life bill, pay for food for their kids. The time commitment that goes into it, I don't think people quite realize. It almost becomes a part-time job just keeping up with all your court requirements. And again, that is time that is not spent for these people to take care of their families and take care of themselves. And when that doesn't happen, that destabilizes clients more, that increases the likelihood that they experience harm again and are rearrested, and then the cycle just starts all back over again. I think the biggest thing um, with coming into this organization, I, I really like their aspect of looking at revamping the criminal justice system because it actually intertwines with a lot of different things, a lot of community organization, a lot of community members, just society in itself. We see so many people that are, that are incarcerated um, that have taken on these guilty um, uh, plea deals um, just to come out in jail and it disrupts the system because it's disrupted not only their individual lives but their family's life, their children, um, their extended families, either uh, uh, people that they've been a part of um, in society. Um, the Bell Project really works with um, not only proposing and um, advocating to end mass incarceration, but they do a lot of um, policy and advocacy um, change. So they do work with um, the uh, 
governmental entities to change policies on community justice and not just um, working individually on um, bail reform, but ensuring that there is a system in place that looks at what is actually going to deter crime in itself. Cash bail is not a deterrence to crime. There is not a guarantee that if they make bond or they make uh, bail, that there is not going to be an additional crime committed based on, on, on these cash bonds. And so I think for me to see it is really looking at um, changing the system where it's going to look at it an individual case by case basis and looking at it as, again, as we talked about the individual needs, posing a cash bail that is way beyond the means of what they can offer. Yes, it, it's, it's, going to keep them and remain them in jail, but you're also going to have other issues that are stemming from that. You're going to have mental health issues. You're going to have physical health that you may never even have started out with in the, in the first place. So really looking at that system, ensuring that we're looking at it in a society perspective where we are evaluating what is it that we're really trying to deter as well as ensuring that we're meeting them at their needs, meaning there has to be a change where we can deter these crimes and we can have society function as a whole together. Together. My work started in twenty in two thousand seven, um, really on by accident. Um, I'm real transparent, professors are like teachers, right? We don't make money during the summer. So a colleague of mine saw this RFP for research on LFOs, legal financial obligations, which I knew nothing about. And she sent it to me and she said, summer money. And so we responded to the RFP to do this little project for the Washington State Minority and Justice Commission, which is an arm of the Washington State Supreme Court. And so we started to reread the statute and learned about what LFOs were. And we are both actually qualitative researchers. We did statistical analysis with a graduate student on some data, but we're really interested in understanding how do the fines and fees impact individuals. You know, people were forced to pay money even after they were incarcerated to the state. There was 12% interest on that money. Corrections officers were telling them to take money out of the table to generate the money. And we were just shocked that this system existed. And I think there was so little research at the time among sociologists, criminologists, because many are middle class. Like there's that intersection in, in academics. We're not objective, pure folks, right? Um, we come to our research with our own biases and perspectives. And I think we ignored the cost. We thought incarceration was the big deal. The felony conviction was the big deal, which it is. But we also didn't realize that $500, $1,000 will devastate the lives of individuals who are being released from incarceration. Some jurisdictions when you owe LFOs will outsource that debt to private collection agencies and then that's how you it affects your credit score and your ability to find housing. In Washington state, like many other states, the statute allows for these private collection companies to add up to 50% of the principal to your debt. So if I owe $1,000, a private collection company can charge me an additional $500 in fees. And so people who, where the debt is outsourced, their debt soars. Um, they have the collection companies pounding on their door and then it natively affects their credit score and that affects their ability to get housing. How do we have the state level system that imposes essentially penal debt to poor people? And what are the consequences when people say they can't pay? What does the system do to them? So ever since the Magna Carta 1215, fines could be imposed to individuals, but they were in small amounts. My research has found um, since the 1990s, courts everywhere are uh, assessing individuals upon conviction fines, fees, costs, surcharges, a whole realm of monetary sanctions. And normally if you go sit in a courthouse any day, you can see someone convicted and that person might get 60, 90 days in jail or even a year or two in prison. But in addition to that incarceration period and uh, court supervision or probation afterwards, they'll get these fines and fees. And so on the day of sentencing, someone receives the amount of their legal financial obligation. If they go to jail, right, 
there's still accruing interest in many jurisdictions on that cost. If they're released, they are given that bill that day. Um, and if they can't pay, then they may be put on payment plans. They may, depending upon the state they're in, have interest accrue. They may have payment um, costs, annual collection surcharges. It affects individuals who are already living in precarious living situations, particularly people with felony convictions, where they have problems getting access to housing, clean and sober, safe housing. They have problems getting access to employment because their employers care about those felony convictions. So there, uh, there's a lot of research that already shows that wages are depressed for people with felony convictions. And on top of that, they have this regular monthly bill. What happens if you don't pay in many jurisdictions, um, you will be summoned to court. And right or wrong, many times people either don't receive the summons because they're houseless, right? And so they don't get the notice or they receive it and they're fearful of going to court. I'm gonna be incarcerated or I have that trauma of returning to that courtroom. I've heard that before from so many people. Um, or they're not paying because they just can't pay and I don't wanna show up, look, cause the judge is gonna sentence me to incarceration. So they don't show up, so it sort of cascades and they'll get a failure failure to appear uh, warrant issued and a warrant will be out for their arrest and some jurisdictions that I've interviewed in one in one of my book have warrant roundups where on the weekend sheriff would go to any addresses or known locations that a person hangs out at and arrest them and take them in for failure to pay appear but it's related to non-payment um, others will be pulled over um, and arrested in many states across this nation, driver's licenses are suspended for non-payment and people could be pulled over on driving dirty without a license and they can go to jail for that. And of course they get more fines and fees uh, for that. So it's just this cascading, both a criminal legal consequence for non-payment related to non-payment, um, a legal consequence in terms of having to report to court, economic consequence, it goes on people's credit sometimes, uh, and a real emotional consequence. I have a recent paper where we really began to look into the data where people describe such a palpable fear and anxiety over this debt. It weighs on them in a similar way to incarceration and it becomes an internalized punishment for folks. People are saying, you know, I go to the grocery store and I'm saying I, I need to pay my LFO bill. I'm not going to get that food for my kid or I'm not going to get this. Like they're constantly making choices. And I interviewed a man who had full-blown AIDS. And he said, I'm gonna get my medication before I pay my LFO bill. So it's this, this internal punishment that people are experiencing because of this debt that they just will never get out from under. Yeah, so it's, it is interesting. While the state has a statute on, on the amount of fines and fees that can be imposed, different municipalities and counties can impose additional costs. And sometimes that is up to the court clerks. Um, sometimes it's up to the court clerks to set that minimum payment amount. Sometimes they have the discretion to decide, oh, I'll waive this for you. I'll waive the interest for you. Or I won't impose the annual collection fee. So, these, this huge structure of financial penalties is sometimes given to people who are non-elected bureaucrats the power to control your life and how much you pay or how much you won't pay. Um, and they base those judgments oftentimes on the character, how they assess your character. And I've seen that in interviews in the way that folks have talked about people coming through the court. Ah, oh, it's a good person, I'll waive it. Ah, oh, he's trying to buy a house, I'll help him. Versus other, this is guy is a piece of, I'm not gonna help him um, and judge him for whatever reason, right? And not help him with giving relief about interest or things like that. Sometimes it's I'll help you with the paperwork, right? It's just something simple like that. And they're withholding um, the use of the help, right? As a tool of power and, and additional control. So I think we have to recognize that the criminal legal system, there's the sentencing, there's the incarceration, there's the financial penalties, but there's also these people that individuals have to deal with. And many times those people can be very, very nice and helpful, but also sometimes can be very mean and demeaning and not show humanity to individuals. And that's one reason why a lot of people say they don't wanna to go to the courthouse, because they don't wanna be disrespected. Um, and so we have to recognize all of the harms that are done to people who are entangled in the system. And this isn't to say I don't wanna romanticize people who have done wrong or violated laws. Everyone needs to be held accountable, but we need to figure out what, what is accountable and what's fair.
right? And if we want to be a society where we mark people for life, uh, Diva Page wrote, wrote about this in her work, Mark of a Criminal Record, if we want to mark people for life, harm them forever, saddle them with debt, and, and f in for their permanently, then we're doing an amazing job. We have the perfect system to do that. But if we really are a society about redemption, you've done wrong, you get a second chance or a first chance in many cases, um, then we need to create that system. We need to recognize that we don't have that system. We need to stop that rhetoric, right? Um, and figure out how can we hold people accountable for what they've done, allow them to meet that bar at some point, and then allow them to re-enter their communities in a successful fashion, set them up for success, for clean, sober, healthy housing, lifestyles, employment. How can we do that? Because we're not doing it now. And we need to be honest with ourselves as a nation.